Hi, this is Mrs. Cribb, and we're going to pick up, we're um, kind of reviewing a little bit about the five most important factors affecting reaction rates, and maybe be able to finish our notes today. We've already talked about the nature of the reactants, which is just what it is. Is it an alkali metal? Is it a noble gas? Does it have eight valence electrons, or two, or one? Is it trying to get, gain more electrons quickly, or get rid of them? So just basically, what is the element? That's going to affect how quickly it reacts. Second thing is concentration, and you should have done a people, de people demo and um, had a lot more people moving around the room trying to, to finish their reaction. So the higher the concentration, the more likely they were to run into each other, and that normally increased the reaction rate. Now, it's, this is general because there are some times when you increase the concentration that it won't affect the reaction rate, but generally it does. Um, you can increase the concentration of gases by adding pressure. You just push the gases closer together, and you, it's basically making it seem like they're more concentrated. There's also a video on elephant toothpaste, which um, is a video that shows you the increase of hydrogen peroxide. So we're going to go to the Prezi for a moment and watch some of these vid videos. Um, again, this is mostly because I'm not there, so we can go ahead and utilize some of our time in class watching these videos. So this is the Prezi again. I'm going to make it larger, and we're going to start off with this video here. Video will talk about reaction theory. rates. She has a chemical reaction that needs to occur more quickly. Our chemist has some processes at her disposal that can help her speed up her reaction, and she knows of five ways. And to remember them, she thinks back to her days as a high school student and the day she got a date for the dance. Harriet was in high school studying between classes. She had lost track of time and was going to be late to class. Unbeknownst to her, Harold, who was just around the corner, was running late too. They both sprinted to class, and as it happened, sprinted directly into one another. Now, this was no small collision. They ran squarely into one another in such a way that he knocked the books right out of her hand. I'm sorry, he said. Let me help you with your books. He kindly helped her recollect her belongings and politely offered to walk her to class. And you'll never guess who went together to the dance later that year. Yep, those two. So as we can see from this example, the key to getting a date for the dance is to collide with someone and knock the books out of their hands. Now, you're probably already aware that not all collisions lead to dates for the dance, thankfully. The collisions must have two important characteristics. One, correct orientation that allows books to be knocked from one's hands, and two, enough energy to knock the books out. Shortly after this incident, Harriet decided to tell me, her chemistry teacher, all about it. I noticed some interesting parallels between her story and chemical reaction rates, which happened to be what she was studying in the hallway the day of the collision. Together, we decided to set out on two missions. Harriet wanted to help all chemistry students and chemists remember how to speed up the rate of chemical reactions, and I, being the nice guy that I am, decided to make it my mission to help create educational environments in which more book-dropping collisions can take place to increase future chemist chances of getting a date for the dance. In order to facilitate this improved dance date-getting process, I propose five changes to all schools that parallel Harriet's five ways to increase chemical reaction rates. First, I propose that we shrink the size of the hallways. This will make it more difficult to safely navigate the hallways and will cause more collisions than in larger hallways. And by increasing the number of collisions, we increase the likelihood that some of those collisions will have the correct alignment and enough energy to create a date for the dance. Now, chemically speaking, this is equivalent to lowering the volume of a reaction vessel or a reaction mixture. In doing so, the individual particles are closer together and more collisions will occur. More collisions means a greater likelihood that collisions with the appropriate energy and configuration will happen. Second, I propose increasing the overall population of the school. More students equals more collisions. By increasing the number of particles available for collision, we create an environment where more collisions will take place. Third, we must reduce the time allowed between classes. Heck, let's just cut it in half. In doing so, students will need to move more quickly to get from one class to the next. This increase in velocity will help make sure collisions have the appropriate amount of energy necessary to ensure book dropping. This is analogous to increasing the temperature of the reaction mixture. Higher temperature means particles are moving faster. Faster moving particles means more energy and a greater likelihood of reaction causing collision. Fourth, students must stop traveling in packs. By traveling in packs, those students on the outside of the pack insulate those in the middle from undergoing any collisions. By splitting up, each student has some more area exposed that is available for a collision from a passing student. 
When particles travel in packs, the surface area is very small, and only the outside particles can collide. However, by breaking up the clumps into individual particles, the total surface area is increased, and each particle has an exposed surface that can react. Fifth, and finally, we hire a matchmaker. Is this colliding and book dropping too violent? Is there an easier way to get a date that requires less initial energy? And a matchmaker will help with this. The matchmaker makes it easier for a couple to get together by coordinating the match. Our matchmaker is like a catalyst. Chemical catalysts function by lowering the activation energy. In other words, by lowering the energy required to start a reaction. They do this by bringing two particles together and orienting them correctly in space so that the two can meet at the correct configuration and allow a reaction to take place. So to sum up, if a future chemist wants a date for the dance, he must collide with another person and knock the books out of their hands. And if a chemist wants to make a chemical reaction occur, the particles must collide in the correct orientation with an appropriate amount of energy. And both of these processes can be accelerated through the five methods I've described. Okay, so hopefully that'll help you with that one. Now this one is about the nature of the reactant, so this is reminding you about the, the metals. Group one of the periodic table is a group of reactive metals. Now, I'm not going to go all the way through this, this one because um, we have had this before, but if you need to remember which one of the metals are reactive and which elements on the periodic table will, re will react more quickly, rather, you can go back and review this video. So we'll skip on from this one. Um, this is just a list of the very reactive metals, the alkali metals, and um, remember Francium, Mama Francium with all her babies. Um, she reacts quickly and she lets go of her extra valence electron, her extra baby. Okay, so that's the nature. Now concentration. This is the video that I'd like to watch about um, element toothpaste. Today we're going to talk about chemical reaction rates, which is how fast chemistry happens. How fast two molecules might bump into each other and become a new kind of molecule. And there's a lot of different things that can affect how fast chemistry happens. Today we're just going to focus on concentration. And to do that, we're going to use an old standby chemical demonstration called elephant toothpaste. What I have here is some uh, hydrogen peroxide and some sodium iodide, which is kind of a salt kind of thing. Uh, mix the two, and this should create a lot of bubbles of oxygen over here, and they'll foam up and be all really cool and exciting and, and be wicked fast. All right? Here goes nothing. Oh, yeah, look, there it is. It's bubbling. Woo, bubbling away. Now, this is 3% hydrogen peroxide. What you could buy at the store if you want to like, clean out a cut or something like that. Be careful with hydrogen peroxide because it, it gives off oxygen gas. So you can see here it goes. It's still bubbling off. Oxygen gas is coming out in a little foam. And I put a little bit of uh, uh, soap in there, dish soap, and that's going to make this cool little foam. And it's still going. So pretty cool. And we just may have to put this on stop time. And remember, this is 3%. 3% hydrogen peroxide. It's still foaming, and it's going to make a mess now. There it goes. Ooh. Classic. Maybe I'll go, oh, here, look. You can see it filming over the side, huh? Beautiful. 3% now. Yeah. Still going. So this is a reaction rate, right? The more hydrogen peroxide that's in there, the faster this should happen. That's one of the things about concentration. The more of a substance, the more concentrated a substance, not just how much it is, the more concentrated, the more likelihood that two molecules will collide and then uh, have a reaction happen. So in this case, the salt and the hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen peroxide molecules will collide and then uh, you get a reaction happen. And the more likely they are to collide, the faster the reaction will happen. And since we have more concentrate, we have less concentrated hydrogen peroxide in here right now, it doesn't happen very fast. Well, this is still moving kind of slowly, very slowly. So we're going to clean this up and let's try it with 30% hydrogen peroxide. 
30% hydrogen peroxide is much more concentrated, so it shall happen faster. There it is, nice and fast. Look at how fast it's happening. That's because chemistry happens faster because there are more molecules present that collide with each other to cause the chemistry to happen. And uh, when this reaction happens, it causes bubbles, so we get lots of bubbles when it happens fast. So 30%, uh, it happens really fast. Now let's just quick back it up and just compare one more time the 3% to the 30%. So going back in time, zoom it right on the back, and we start off with the 3% hydrogen peroxide, and you can see that there's not very many molecules. Well, you can't see that, but it's moving very slowly because the collisions happen uh, slower. They don't collide as often to cause the chemistry to happen. And then if we kick it up a notch to 30% hydrogen peroxide, the chemistry happens much faster. Boom. There it goes. So we have learned today that the more concentrated your chemicals, the faster your chemical reactions will happen. Okay, yeah. So hopefully we'll get a chance to do that in per person. Next is temperature. And I'm going to go back for a moment um, to your notes. So temperature we covered. And I, hopefully you had a chance to do a demo on temperature using the, um, what are they called, glow, glow sticks. This is the glow stick demo. And um, we tried to do that in lab. If we didn't do it in lab, you can stop the video right here and do the glow stick lab here. But remember for temperature, temperature is an average kinetic energy. And generally, the rate of a reaction will double, go up two times for every 10 degrees. So. If I go from, if I run a reaction at 20 degrees Celsius and then, then I want it to go twice as fast, I can run it at 30 degrees Celsius. And so whatever the rate was before at 20, it is now two times that at 30. So if the rate was R for 20 degrees, it'd be two times that for 30. What if I raise it another 10 degrees up to 40 degrees? Well, whatever the rate was before at 20 degrees, it went up by twice as much at 30 degrees and at 40, that's another 10 degree increase it's going to go up another ten, another two times. So basically it's R times 2 squared or 4 times as fast. So every 10 degrees it goes up another, it doubles again. So at 50 degrees it would be R and now I've increased 1, 2, 3 times or 2 to the third power, 2 times 2 times 2. So now it's um, 8 times as fast. R is 8 times faster. And we'll review that some a little bit later. Then surface area, which basically is saying, and they, the, the video about the students breaking up out of the clumps, the more surface area that's available, the more places you could hit the molecule and cause it to react. And in surface area, you have heterogeneous reactions um, come up in this particular idea because you have two reactants that have different phases. And so when you're usually going to have like a liquid with a solid broken up inside of it. Um, that's why it's just like a solid and a liquid. So heterogeneous reactants have different phases for their reactants. And then the presence of a catalyst. All right, the presence of a catalyst does the job of, of um, shortening the, the pathway, lowering the activation energy. So I'm going to go back to the Prezi for just a moment, and let's see what videos I have. We're not going to go through video 9, because I'm hoping you did that in class. If not, you can watch that later. And this is talking about breaking up the solid into smaller pieces so that then you can react all the way around it. So increasing the surface area. Let's look at this one. Surface area affects the rate of a chemical reaction. Here we have some lycopodium powder. I'm going to place a small amount of it onto this ceramic plate. I'm then going to show you with a Bunsen burner flame that this powder really does not burn in the form that we might expect it to burn as a very flammable powder. And yet, when we allow this powder to sift into the flame as a dust, we've increased the surface area around each particle and the oxygen concentration around each particle increases. Let's do that now. Notice that 
It was a very quick reaction. The chemical reaction that you just saw with the lycopodium powder, where the increased rate of the chemical reaction was due to the increased surface area, is the cause of dust explosions in grain elevators, where the wheat has been ground to flour, and that dust fills the tubes of the grain elevator. Okay, so notice there that he just made uh, dust particles, basically. So now it was much more surface area, and it, it reacted quickly, and it burnt quickly. All right, now the presence of a catalyst, um, it changes, uh, a catalyst is a substance that, that changes the reaction rate without being, a perma without being permanently changed or consumed by the reaction itself. It gives the reaction a second path to take, a shortcut. It's not a reactant itself. The catalyst is not a reactant and it's not a product. It's just basically a shortcut. It lowers the activation energy. Okay? It will not enable a thermodynamically impossible reaction to occur. So if something's not going to happen, it's not going to make it happen. It just makes the things that can happen faster. One theory states that a catalyst will hold reactants in just the right positions. In other words, turn them to face each other just right to make favorable conditions happen. Okay, so we're going to do a um, little drawing about catalysts. So let's draw my picture here. First, I'm going to draw a couple of different things. Um, what a catalyst does is we have the reactants and we have an activation energy and products. And the back activation energy here is really big. Okay. So I have to push the ball, the reactants, up the hill a lot. And so that's extending a lot of energy. So this has a big, that's the EA, the activation energy is large. Okay? When I add a catalyst, I basically lower the hill. So now I have a smaller activation energy from right here. EA is smaller. It makes it easier for the reaction to happen. So let's talk about what a catalyst is. I'm going to draw a picture. And I want you to put this in your notes, okay? I'm going to try to draw this picture. So on this side, we have a guy standing on a cliff, okay? And then um, we have another cliff on this side. And on the other side, we're going to have a girl standing on the cliff. Okay, there's the guy and the girl. Now the guy wants to go see the girl. So normally what he has to do is climb down the cliff and go across the valley and climb up the cliff. And then he can see the girl and he'll be standing right over here with her. And they, it's, a, it's a reaction. It's a chemical reaction. All right, the line, the blue line, represents the amount of energy it took for him to get to the girl. Well, what can we do to make this easier for him? We can put in a catalyst. So I'm going to erase this now, and you can draw more than one picture if you want, but I'm just going to erase the one I have here, and draw in what the catalyst does. Well, what a catalyst really is, is a bridge. That's the catalyst. The catalyst allows the amount of energy that the guy is going to have to expend to go down. Now he can walk straight across the bridge. And the ending product is the same. He's going to be standing there with the girl, and um, they're going to be a nice, happy couple. But he only had to expend a little bit of energy rather than climbing down and going across and coming up. So that's a catalyst. It lowers the activation energy from a big energy to a lower energy. It basically gives you another pathway. But notice the catalyst is not, here's the, the reactants for the boy and the girl by themselves. And the product are the boy and the girl as a couple. Okay? So the reactants were the boy and the girl by themselves, and then the product were the couple. The catalyst is not a reactant or a, pro or a product. I could draw this reaction like this boy plus girl get together, and they perform. the boy-girl couple, okay? So here they are, the boy and the girl couple. Now, the catalyst is not in that reaction at all. It's just uh, sitting there to allow this to happen faster. Okay, now there's something else called an inhibitor. And it's a little bit farther down in your notes. So we talked a little bit about there's such a thing as homogeneous catalyst. And all that means is in the same phase as the reactants. 
So if the reactants are liquids, the catalyst is liquid. If the reactants are solids, the catalyst is solid. And we have heterogeneous catalysts. It means it's a different phase. So if the reactants are liquid, maybe the catalyst is a solid or vice versa. Um, enzymes are a special kind of class of catalysts. They occur in biological systems. The presence of an enzyme will cause a reaction to occur millions of times faster than the reaction without a catalyst, and they're usually proteins. Now we come to this little guy here, inhibitor. An inhibitor is used to reduce the catalyst's undesirable effects. So it basically slows it back down. It blocks the places where they would get together. So what would an inhibitor be in my little drawing? So I'm going to draw a picture of an inhibitor. Let's see. Hmm. I'll just make it black. Here's the inhibitor. It's dad. And I should put angry eyebrows on his face. Dad is the inhibitor. Perhaps he is stopping this reaction from happening so fast. Okay, he's cleaning his gun or he's pointing at the fella saying, no, 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 you can't get to my girl. Okay, that's an inhibitor. The inhibitor would cause this reaction to have to either take the longer path or maybe even stop the reaction from happening at all. So we should have done a demo right here in class, um, hopefully and illustrating inhibitors and catalysts using different people. So let's go back to the Prezi for a moment. And I think I have some uh, pictures that I want you to look at. First of all, notice the activation energy here. This blue is the uncatalyzed, sorry. That means no catalyst. So the activation energy, the comparison of the reactants to the top of the activation, to the top of the hill, has it's big. But when I add the catalyst, the activation energy went down. Homogeneous catalyst in the same phase. So here we have two liquids and the catalyst in, in what is the, which one is the catalyst? The first is starting substance on the right docks at a specific site on the catalyst. So this is the catalyst and these catalysts right here bring the substance together to help it to form um, a molecule faster. Okay, the starting substance, the right, this is it. It sticks onto the catalyst. Another one sticks onto the catalyst. Well, that forces it to get close together, so it forms its bond. So those are both liquid catalysts. And this is um, some solid catalysts, like this, the nickel is the solid. This would be one where it's um, possibly a heterogeneous, because we have a gas, a hydrogen gas, and, and we have methane, ethane, ethene gas and nickel solid. So that nickel again is holding the gases in place, making them stick, and that brings them closer to each other and so they can form their new molecule. So, and now we have some enzymes. Enzymes have activated sites or active sites. We have a substrate that comes and bonds to the active site. The substrate binds the enzyme forming an enzyme substrate complex and then that helps it to be able to undergo its change in when it gets done. We end up with glucose and fructose in this case. And we have that same catalyst again all by itself. So the enzyme just re gets reused. Um, it's not part of the reactant or part of the product. It's just the short pathway. Here's another picture of one. Again, the enzyme, the two amino acids come and attack, sit on the enzyme that brings them close together. That makes it easier for them to bond and then the enzyme is free up again to be used all over again. So those are catalysts. And then inhibitors used to reduce the catalyst's undesirable effects. Here's the picture. Now an inhibitor, there's the catalyst, an inhibitor bonds to it, see it? And so what it does is it's blocking one of the places to keep the reaction from happening. When the reactants try to bond to the catalyst, they are blocked by that inhibitor. The red guy here is the inhibitor. They can't get in that spot. They, they block the reaction from happening. Okay, we just drew that. So that brings us to reaction mechanisms. Um, I think I'll go ahead and use the ones right we have here. Um, a reaction mechanism is just steps that, that a reaction is going to take in order to happen. It's a series of steps. No, oh, let me go back. Um, the first one is, it, is the reaction mechanism is often made of a two or more possible steps, and the, the steps themselves are called elementary steps. 
And then one of them are going to be the rate determining step. And that's always the one that causes the, uh, it determines how fast something can happen. So if I'm going to make cookies, uh, i got to get the ingredients out, and i got to mix them up together. But what slows me down the most usually is cooking the cookies in the oven or baking the cake in the oven. That is the longest process. That would be the rate determining step. So whatever step takes the longest amount of time determines the rate of the reaction. So here, if this is just showing you different possibilities. We have step one, and it has a tiny little activation energy. Okay, And this is the enthalpy, the delta H, right here. Because that's the reactants, and the C is the product. So that's the energy of the reactants compared to the energy of the products. But this particular reaction has three steps. So one, two, three elementary steps. The first one has a tiny activation energy. Step number two has a bigger activation energy. And step number three has a bigger activation energy. Okay, but each one of those steps are um, the elementary steps, and this is the biggest activation energy, the one that takes the longest, that will be the rate determining step. The one that has the biggest activation energy or takes the longest is the rate determining step. So let's look at some more. Um, here we have, you can write these on in your notes if you'd like. Um, or you could also stop and go back to the Prezi, but you are going to need to be able to do this. Uh, we have, what we're trying to do is basically, this is the net equation. This is what you normally see written on the board. Um, we have a fuel and hydrogen, and it's creating another fuel. But it's actually more than one step. First, we take the hydrogen and break it apart. And then we take the single hydrogen and bond it to get five hydrogens instead of four. And then we take the other hydrogen and bond it to get six hydrogens. And so that would be the total or the net equation. Okay. Now this is without a catalyst, so each step, step one, there's step one, has a big activation energy. And then there's step two, and its activation energy, and then step three, and its activation energy. Okay, and then the beginning reactant to the end products are exactly the same. Now if we add a catalyst, and this time it's palladium, it lowers the activation energies for the steps. See, number two is lowered a lot. So that makes this reaction happen faster. Notice that this is used, but it's not part of the end product. And that's because we could basically cross these out on both sides. And we'll review this together when I come back as well. So here's another reaction with elementary steps. We have ozone, O3, becoming O2 and O. And then we have O3 becoming two O2s. The net equation is to take these two O3s to create one, two, three O2s. Well, what about this O? Well, if you see an oxygen, if you see a reactant on both sides, here and here, you can cross them out, cancel them out on both sides, just like you do math. That means they're not part of the net equation. This is the final net equation. So if you need to pause that and think about what I said, please do that. Just like math, I cancel this out. I could subtract this zero from both sides, and it would disappear. And I would have, if I add up the two equations, I have one, two, O threes, and one, two, three, O twos to get my net equation. So elementary steps, um, you also, you sometimes create these transition states that get um, canceled out. All right, the last slide for general chemistry is going to be some examples from the text about this, and so I'm going to wait and review that and when, we get, when I get back to class with you. So let's look at my document one more time. We talked about these and we're going to, during a, a compl complex reaction, there are intermediates and I'm going to write some of these in with you when I get back. So I'll really, I'll just start right here and then honors is going to have to continue on to finish these additional notes on the separate video. Okay, if you have time to um, go back and watch any of the other videos, you can or uh, if you didn't have a chance to use the glow sticks, this is the time to do it as well. I'll see you soon.